was supposed to take a hint there. Good. Thank you. All right. So my name's Matthew Garrett. Um, unlike in previous years, I do not work on fruit flies. Instead, I'm uh, working full time at Red Hat, uh, concentrating on power management and uh, functionality, and with some work on mobile devices. And today, well, previous years, I've generally been talking about suspend resume and why it doesn't work. Uh, but really, by now, you've probably all got quite bored of hearing the same excuses. Right now, suspend resume is at the point where we have a pretty solid understanding of where the problems are and what we have to do to fix them and who we need to give large parts of money to to make this happen. So, for me, that's not a really interesting problem. I'm instead going to be talking to you today about runtime power management. And power management, as a general topic, consists of various uh, subtopics. We have suspend resume, obviously. Then we have uh, things like disabling unused hardware. So an example of this, and um, the most common one, would be, for instance, turning off your monitor when the system's been idle for a while. But this also means being able to, say, power down your Bluetooth radio when you're not using any Bluetooth functionality. And then there's something that's more of a shade of grey. The first two are very binary operations. The hardware is either running or it's not running. The hardware is either available or it's unavailable. The more interesting case for me is when we have the hardware, when we can make use of the hardware, but we can detect the extent to which we need to be providing that hardware's functionality. So an example of this case might be CPU frequency scaling, where we run the processor at different speeds and voltages depending on how much work you have to get done. And that's mostly what I'm going to be concentrating on today. So, this is uh, a power management control interface from the Windows 95 days. As you can see, it's fairly straightforward. You have four options. Um, you can turn off the monitors. You can spin down the hard drives, and you can have the system automatically go to standby or go to hibernate. And for each of these options, you have a little drop-down menu. And you click on that drop-down menu, and it gives you a range of times to choose. And in the mid-90s, this was cutting edge. The fact that your computer went to sleep at all was, frankly, amazing. So really, we shouldn't criticize from that point of view. But how many of you have your laptops or desktops spin down their hard drives? Yep. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So when you pick that time, the threshold for when your laptop drive should spin down, how do you do that? Right. You either just use a default number, or you spend a while thinking, hmm, well, I don't want it to spin down too often, but I want it to spin down sometime before the heat death of the universe. So let's just pick, say, 10 minutes. That sounds like a nice, safe default, which, of course, means that your disk spends a huge amount of time spinning and doing nothing of any use. And what we tend to find is that providing this kind of power management interface isn't helpful. You're asking users to choose values that they can't predict. And in a lot of cases, there isn't even a single correct answer. The correct threshold to spin down a disk drive, for a hard drive, for instance, will depend strongly on the current workload. If over the past 10 minutes or so, your system has been very regularly writing a few blocks and then waiting a minute, and then writing a few more blocks and then waiting a minute, then you might as well spin it down aggressively, because you've now got evidence that you can spin this down, and then nothing else will happen for the next minute, and then you can spin it back up. And that's be an overall power saving. But at other times, uh, you'll have sufficiently random disk access that a time to spin down after a minute would result in uh, the disk spinning back up a few seconds later. So this sucks. 
it's really, really unfortunate. Um, the other problem with it is that it falls far of the fairly typical give a user options and they will play with them. Users are really kind of like trained monkeys, <laughs> except they're not very well trained. <laughs> you put a user in front of a computer, and your user thinks, hmm, I really wish I had better battery life. And then you give the user something like this, and you tell the user, hey, one of these options will make your battery last longer. All the others will result in you being shot in the skull. But none of them <laughs> is great. And the user will sit there, going through each of these options, and then they'll eventually think, wow, I've chosen the perfect option. Now I get an extra three seconds of battery life. I've measured this. So we don't want to do this, because there isn't a right answer, and your users will spend three years attempting to find the correct answer that isn't there. And they could be doing much better things with their life than that. They could be sitting in the sun. They could be dancing. They could be giving me money. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, this is how things were in the Windows 95 days. Obviously, we've got past this point. Technology's moved on significantly, and this is what Vista looks like. <laughs> Unfortunately not, but uh, the relevant thing here is that you see that scroll bar. You see that very small box in it. <laughs> I don't know what all these options do, as I'm paid to care about this kind of thing. So, uh, well, obviously, one interpretation of this would be that I'm incompetent. I prefer the version that instead implies that this is poor user interface design. Of that. When you provide this kind of interface to a user, again, you're going to leave them frantically trying to work out which of these options will result in them getting an extra five minutes of battery life, and which of these options will cause their system to fall over into a small pile of rubble every time they plug in the PCIe card. So this is also not a good approach. We've now added way more flexibility to power management. There are now so many ways to save power on a computer that even I don't know what they all do. And then we still ask the user to choose the correct options. I'm right, as you may have gathered, I'm not really a fan of this approach. This is one of the more user-obvious pieces of power management design. This is uh, from Sony Z SZ series Vio. Um, in this particular iteration, there's an onboard Intel graphics chipset, and there's a discrete NVIDIA GPU. And when you flick this switch, a little box comes up and tells you to reboot now. <laughs> But that's actually been fixed with the latest generation. Uh, there's now some magic that allows Windows to change the GPU you're running on the fly. <laughs> this is deeply scary, and we don't know how it works, because the obvious straightforward way of doing it would have been to use, say, PCIe hot plug. So, of course, that's what they didn't do. <laughs> Instead, there's some magic GPIO lines that you have on. Oh, and the wonderful thing about this design, and the latest ones, is there's uh, the GPIO lines that you apparently use to control the switching between GPUs is the same type of GPIO lines... <laughs> the same type of GPIO lines that you would otherwise be using to control the digital video output. So, uh, on these ones, if you use the Intel chipset, then you don't get DVI or DisplayPort. But obviously, the fact that you've got a speed standard switch makes up for that. <laughs> what you're saying when you have a switch like this is, please, Mr. User, or Mrs. User, or Ms. User, as the situation uh, requires, please tell me whether you're running anything that is going to draw things quickly. And by the way, tell me that before you turn the computer on. 
another way of looking at this is <laughs> except every time you take the computer out, things have been switched around into a random order. You've got no idea in advance whether you want speed or stamina. And, well, it's a stupid question. Of course you want speed, and of course you want stamina. Um, yeah. Oh, I see. It goes when the screen turns off. And unfortunately, this is the screen that has the clock on. Yes. That'll be twenty thousand dollars, please. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure this isn't running any piece of software that I support. <laughs> right. Anyway, as I was saying, but right now the entire power management paradigm is still devoted to this pushing policy out to the users thing. And right, sure, in general. Policy is better left in the users than in the kernel, for instance. But when the policy is, do I want to suck, or do I want to fall down a well? Or do I want to succeed massively? Then uh, you're not asking the right type of question. The real basic problem, and I probably have I've said this already several times in different ways, I'm going to carry on saying this in different ways in the hope that all of you and actually believe me here. The fundamental problem is that you can't ask the user to tell you precisely how they're going to use the system because the user doesn't know. Users are very simple creatures. A user is going to sit down and they're going to take their computer out and they're going to attempt to do something with that computer. And okay, a lot of the time, what they're going to attempt to do with their computer is either uh, watch hardcore pornography or attempt to download the latest uh, videos off a cinema screen movie. But sometimes they're actually going to do something that is useful and will contribute to society. And we should make it much easier for people to do that. Because otherwise, eventually, there's going to be some sort of revolution. Everybody's going to realize that they've wasted years of their lives with computers, and they're all going to find us and kill us. <laughs> so the other reason I'm trying to convince you of this is that if I'm the guy who doesn't suck and I end up being lynched anyway, I'm going to be really unhappy with the rest of you. <laughs> so the user wants to be able to get their work done. They want to be able to write their documents. They want to be able to uh, produce their grand cultural work they want to download their hardcore pornography. And we need to be able to allow them to do that while consuming as little power as possible. Now, at this point, if you look at the way that a user uses a computer, I mean, if you take a day's tracking information about every single operation that computer performs, and you graph it, then you can say, right, well, here, we could have put this PCIe link into a lower power state, and then it was been in a low power state for long enough that it was been an overall win to have that power down, even if powering it back up costs slightly more power. Or we could see that at this point, there's 20 minutes where nothing happens, and if we'd switch the screen off here, then that was been a worthwhile power saving exercise. The problem with this approach is that you can't normally in time to do this. So we have to approximate to an extent, but really there are three prime constraints here. The first is latency, and almost every single power saving operation that we work with introduces extra latency. The most obvious one of these is when you spin down your hard drive. If the hard drive spun down, the next time you have to hit disk, your drive is going to spend a few seconds spinning back up, and it's going to make irritating noises while it does so. So one argument is that we want to minimize latency. The other one is that we also want to reduce power consumption. And obviously, spinning the disk down aggressively will often save more power, but introduce more latency. 
it's kind of difficult to balance these. People come up with wonderful mathematical models, and they just make arbitrary claims about them. Axiom is wonderful. And then the final one is the desired functionality. If the user is trying to watch a film, then turning their screen off is a really bad idea. It's the kind of thing that makes them install Windows again. So when we're trying to work out what to do with a piece of hardware, we need to think about all three of these things. We want to think about how much latency we'll be introducing and how that latency will affect the user. We need to think about how much power we're saving or consuming by having a piece of hardware in a given state. And we need to think about what functionality the user wants. In a lot of cases, we can just look at the behavior of the user and produce a mathematical model of this behavior. Hard drive spin-up, spin-down things are pretty straightforward. Uh, there's been a lot of well-published literature, uh, lots of published literature on how to come up with mathematically optimal spin-down strategies for hard drives. Last time I tried to implement one of them, it turns out that if you altered one variable that should have almost no influence on it whatsoever, except to make it more computationally expensive, but also more accurate, it gives you answers as a different by an order of magnitude. So, um, in principle, it's a well understood problem, and we could just put this code into the real world today. In reality, academia. <laughs> But even so, computers are very good at doing maths, and a lot of power management problems turn out to be maths problems. You're just trying to produce a model and then optimize for certain things. Hardware spin down, as I said, is a nice straightforward one, and the reason that we're interested in that at the moment is that, well, in the future we'll have SSDs and the world will be awesome. We still have customers with millions of rotating magnetic media devices who would kind of like to be able to tell their shareholders that they have increased their green credentials and saved money, and please can they keep the corporate jets as a result. And depressingly, hard drives are an interesting area from this point of view. We can buy spins on hard drives. Even now, a desktop hard drive is about 10 watts of power. A server one, if you're talking about a 15k RPM disk, you're really draining a lot of power, and then that's generating heat, and then that's got to be got rid of with air conditioning, which takes heat, and right, people want their disks to spin down, and unfortunately we can't just buy them all SSDs yet. If Intel had been you know, a few years faster at this, then I would never have had to care, so thanks Intel. <laughs> So, as I said earlier, static timeouts are the wrong approach in general for disk spin down because you can't beforehand predict what the access band is going to be. Okay. How many of you think that you can actually predict when a disk is going to be accessed, roughly? Taking into account, for instance, the fact that this IRQ might happen, the kernel might then want to allocate a buffer sometime afterwards, and then that might cause something to be swapped out. You can't. There isn't a great answer. The computer is better at this than you are. And machine learning techniques provide some... Uh, there are machine learning techniques that have been used to model this, and as I said, they don't seem to work that well, but I'm looking into that more closely. This is a generic case. We want to not just think about this for disks. We want to be able to try to think about this for all hardware. We want to know what the user's doing. We want to know how we can reduce the power consumption of the hardware as a result. And we also want to make sure that we don't do things like turn off your wireless when you're downloading files, or turn off your Bluetooth while you're transferring files to your phone, or turn off your screen when you're watching the hardcore pornography that you downloaded over your phone earlier in the day. I don't have to like my users. I just need to convince them they still give me money. There are various things that we can do here that, uh, in some of these, some of these we actually do, uh, and in some of them we don't. But these are examples of cases where we can reduce the power consumption of a machine with very little or no user impact. I'm going to go through some of these in more detail now. A 
Laptops have displays that are connected to the video hardware by something called an um, LVDS bus, uh, Low Voltage Differential Signaling. The LVDS bus has to transfer an entire image to your screen at the refresh rate. So 60 times a second, we transmit 1024 by 768 pixels, and each pixel is, say, uh, Oh, wait, actually, uh, most CFTs are still in the 18 bits, so it's not quite as bad. But you'd have to transmit a lot of data. And if you're doing that 60 times a second, then that bus has to run quite fast. And every time you're sending that image across the bus, not only are you using the power sent across the bus, you're also using power, scanning it out of your frame buffer memory. Memory accesses cost power. The reason that we have a refresh rate of, say, 60 hertz to begin with is that at lower refresh rates, when you move an object, you'll get blurring. It'll take longer for the TFT to update. And uh, you get blurry jerkiness. It looks like, well, say, a laptop from 1995. We don't really want to do that, but laptops in fact, most computers spend most of their time displaying static images. What we can do is, well, oddly enough, it turns out that the graphic driver knows whether something is moving on screen or not, because it's the one doing the moving. And if your graphics driver can't tell you that, then your graphics driver is very, very dumb. The graphics driver can, on detection of the screen going idle, downplot the LVDS. Intel hardware actually lets us do this magically. There's two, um, well, there's the clock for the LVDS, and then there's two sets of post divisors. So you can program one of them to be the standard output rate. You can program one of them to be a reduced rate, and then there's a bit in the GPU. You flip that bit, and at the next first call refresh, it switches to the lower refresh rate. Instantaneously, there is no visible graphical artifact caused by this. We can save, uh, so on my machine I tested this and with no impact upon the quality of the display, we could save half a watt. That's not determined by the physical size of your screen, that's determined by the resolution of the screen. The higher the resolution, the more this technique saves you. And that's free power. Nothing breaks when you do this, except for a couple of bugs and it turns out that when you do this, uh, then eventually the X server crashes. <laughs> I think that one's actually been fixed. There was another bug in X timers that sounds like it could have been the same thing. Uh, it doesn't actually crash. It just gets into a loop where it checks whether a timer's fired and finds that the delta's zero or something. So, yeah, X, to be honest. Sorry. <laughs> GPUs. Uh, GPUs are obviously graphics processing units. Then nowadays, on some systems, they have significantly higher transistor count than your CPU. <laughs> NVIDIA, has anybody seen pictures of NVIDIA's new uh, mobile x86 platform? It's got an Atom on it, and the Atom's about this big, and then there's the GPU and chipset, and it's about this big. And the reason Atom is as big as it is, is because you need that much space to get all the pins out. It would be smaller otherwise. <laughs> Discrete GPUs often have large chunks of memory, and they clock this memory very, very fast, so that when you're playing Half-Life 2, it doesn't take half a second for somebody's textures to get paged in when they attempt to shoot you in the head. Instead, uh, they can pull all this information out of the video memory very quickly, they can pass through onto their triangles, and then they can make those triangles jump up and down at whatever it is that games do these days. As I said, computers spend most of their time not actually displaying anything of any interest whatsoever. Or when this is interesting, it's interesting because you're trying to read it, and you don't really want your text to be on fire, regardless of what some Compass developers might be trying to convince you about. <laughs> And as I said, in the 
And in the F case, we know when your screen's idle. Same's true here. Instead of just downclocking a bus, we can downclock your video memory. We can downclock your GPU. I've written some code that works on this with um, Razeon. The difficult aspect, it turns out, is that uh, re-clocking your video memory while you're trying to scan a frame buffer as your video memory doesn't work so well. You get this bit where, oh, uh, for a few milliseconds, the memory doesn't answer you. And so you just get big black boxes on your desktop. That kind of sucks. So I've had to end up reverse. <laughs> yeah. Right, now see, this is an example of what I'm talking about. It's got a static timeout, and it's not going to learn that I keep hitting it every time it powers down. Go and see the clock, and then I talk to you for three hours, and then you kill me. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, right, so the memory controller we need to tear down, reprogram, bring back up, and this is all completely undocumented. Uh, AMD thankfully have a <laughs> true and complete language in their drivers that reads a table out of the BIOS and executes it, and so we just look at what it's doing, and then do the same thing, except without as many sleep statements. <laughs> so if we do that, the moment we get a vertical blank interrupt, then we can do it while it's not actually drawing anything on the screen, and then you don't get any visual damage, and it's awesome. This saves about 10 watts on an X1900, again, with no visible loss of performance or uh, graphical artifacts, because the moment you do something, we just clock everything back up again. Uh, that is, the code for this is all dependent on the Radeon mode setting code that hasn't been merged yet, so I'm waiting for the interface for that to stabilize. So you don't want to do this kind of thing in X, because X is not very good at providing low latency responses to interrupts. What with it not being the kernel and everything. USB is a great thing. Um, Ways in which USB are great include USB doesn't really support the concepts of interrupts. Uh, you have to poll every device every so often to ask if it wants to do anything. There's some sort of out of bad stuff to fix with something like this, but anyway, yeah, USB, sit there, you've got your USB flash drive plugged in, you've got your USB printer plugged in, you've got your USB scanner plugged in, you've got your USB AD sound modem plugged in. And because they're plugged in, the hardware is having to poll all of these devices every so often. And when I say every so often, I mean every few milliseconds to see whether anybody's just pressed a button on the printer. This USB spec actually uh, was not written by morons. And so this uh, issue was considered. Most USB devices can be put into a power down state and will then trigger a wake up when something happens with the hardware that should result in the operating system paying attention. So, uh, well, I'm, one obvious example of this is a mouse. You put the mouse to sleep, then the user comes along, presses the mouse button, the mouse wakes back up, and you've just lost the mouse button. But anyway, mouse not a great example of this. Optical mice, you power them down, you move the mouse, and obviously it doesn't notice because the optics are turned off. Well, mm. right, okay. I'm sure Ben has many choice words to use to describe various bits of USB, but we'll leave that to some other time. Linux actually has a lot of support for this functionality. The problem with it in some cases has been uh, that the hardware fucking sucks. <laughs> so, for instance, most scanners or printers, if you attempt to put them to sleep, will never come back onto the USB bus, ever. You need to unplug them and plug them back in. But that's something we can work around eventually. What we end up doing is, by default, we only do auto-suspend on hardware that Windows does auto-suspend on by default, which turns out to be USB hubs only. Individual drivers can override that, and we're working on infrastructure to allow user space to produce a whitelist and then uh, 
switch on power saving on a case-by-case -case basis. So this will work. We're gradually getting to the point where USB can power down. And you can power down entire USB bus, then you can also look at powering down the USB core, and it'll all be awesome and wonderful when it works, which will be at some point in the future, possibly once we've stopped using USB. <laughs> Wi-Fi is a more interesting case in many ways. The 8211 specification has a variety of power saving modes. Uh, we don't really make use of any of them at the moment, uh, but work has been going on lately to integrate this into the Mac 8211 layer. Primarily, you do things like, um, for instance, one mode, you have the chip not wake up if you see a broadcast packet or a multicast packet, and that way the you still want to have the radio powered up, but you're not waking the operating system and host CPU up every time a packet you don't care about goes past. Obviously, defining whether you care about broadcasts and multicast packets is an application issue rather than a kernel issue. Uh, OLPC, for instance, cares about multicast packets. Um, as far as I can tell, OLPC mostly cares about multicast packets in the hope of trying to avoid ever having to touch them so that you don't lose all your battery life. But the other power saving modes include things like re increasing the amount of time between beacons, uh, batching packets up and transmitting them all in one go instead of as they come in. Obviously, that increases latency. Whether you care about that increased latency depends on what you're doing. If you're, you, if you're just doing normal, straightforward web browsing, by which I mean you're not running JavaScript and the numbers 2.0 do not appear, then you don't care. That latency is basically invisible to you. It takes a tiny bit longer to load the web page, but the overall bandwidth is much the same. SSH is more of a problem. Australians probably don't notice because, hey, Australian internet. It's the joke that keeps on giving. <laughs> so, in some cases, it's a simple matter of writing code. The LVDS reclocking stuff is just code that I need to stabilize and put in the driver. The GPU power management is code that, uh, well, you know, we should probably actually talk to AMD about it and work out why they don't do this anyway. Uh, and the answer could be, well, we didn't think this, or the answer could be, oh, yeah, that works fine, except one in every 10,000 times when the GPU will lock up. Because, seriously, graphics hardware vendors. I'm just, right, excellent. See, this is the kind of thing I shouldn't have to do. It's trading me, yes, right, that's a problem. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that results in me eventually expending an excessive amount of time finding out who is responsible for this design. Sitting outside their house for three years with a tent and a big sign saying that they're the worst person in the universe. <laughs> and not fixing any of your bugs. So if you're this guy, don't do that, if you ever watch this. By the way, I didn't kill your dog. <laughs> that was probably someone else. But as I said, we need more information from user space applications as to what they want to do. There's no real way for the kernel to be able to tell whether a given application wants low latency mobile traffic or not. So we need to provide an interface by which this information can be passed down from the things that know whether we have latency constraints or know whether we have power constraints, and then something at the bottom can make a policy decision based on that. We've got something that does some of this in the kernel now. It's called the uh, Power Management Quality of Service Framework. It's, uh, you open a device node, and then you write the maximum latency in microseconds as an integer into that device node. And then you hold the file node open for the duration of your of you having that constraint, and then you close it again, and then the column keeps a list of these and uses the most constraining of the constraints when making decisions. Currently, that only works for processor C states, which are a case where if the processor is idle, it will power chunks of itself down. Uh, 
deeper sea states result in more of the hardware being powered down and a greater latency when coming back up. Some applications are very sensitive to that latency. So we have this infrastructure so that the application can say, I cannot accept this any latency more than this. Please don't put the hardware in a state where the latency becomes worse than this. There's also something for network traffic. Uh, sorry, for uh, dev PMQS network which should probably be tied into the wireless power management work, but currently isn't. One other bizarre case is um, when we do processor speed scaling, we reduce the speed of the processor, but that results in other things slowing down as well. On current Intel mobile chipsets, when you go to the lowest processor performance state, the front side bus is also underclocked, so you now have less bandwidth and increased latency to your system memory. Or even just because you're running slower, there's the enhanced latency there and certain workloads are very uh, sensitive to that kind of thing. We've seen on some database-based benchmarks that using CPU freq results in us losing like 30% of performance, even though there's not, even though the system isn't CPU bound at all. A so really utterly crackful way of thinking about this is that we should have a net filter module where you say if you see packets to this source address or uh, that match whatever other filter, then increase the speed of the processor. It's not a particularly pleasant idea. But this is our plan for the future. Uh, I think this is a pretty excellent plan. Um, eventually, you'll get to the point where computers will spend most of their time not doing anything and you won't notice. I'm hoping that when we get to this point, then I can spend most of my time doing nothing, and nosy will notice. <laughs> now, some things are, gen are certainly personal preferences. We can't always pick a right answer for things like backlight brightness, because that depends on whether you're blind or not. Um, we can't really ask that at first boot. Do your eyes work? Yes, no. And then over time, the hard, well, certainly with cathode tube-based laptop backlights, the tube will wear over time. You'll get reduced light output, so the user needs to be able to compensate for that. So we would like to get rid of the Vista-type user interface almost completely and leave you just with things like one on battery set backlight to this. In fact, in GNOME, that's the UI we have. Unfortunately, uh, just some other things don't work as a result. But we've now got the UI we want. Uh, and now it's a simple matter of making everything else sufficiently magic that we can keep that UI. And there's, I think, one last question in my abstract, which was, uh, are we ever going to get to Beer Island? Beer Island, it turns out, is a bar at an intersection somewhere in Texas. <laughs> Google suggests that we kayak across the Pacific. <laughs> Right. And the answer to the question, are we ever going to get to Beer Island, is probably not. We'll die in the attempt. Anyway, thank you. So, uh, does anyone have any questions? to dealing with the fact that laptop batteries lie to us almost as much as politicians. <laughs> laptop, uh, the battery has a difficult job. It's got to attempt to tell you how much information went into it and how much, sorry, how much energy went into it and how much energy has come out of it again. That's not particularly easy to do, uh, especially when things like current flow uh, depend on temperature and all kinds of really awful insanity. And as they get older, they get worse at it, because the behavior of the cells starts becoming even more nonlinear. 
All we can really do from that perspective is have user space look at the current draw, look at the discharge curve of the battery, and attempt to infer what the true behavior of the battery is. GNOME Power Manager at least has some code to do that. Um, that's why it keeps using the word estimated for various things. Can it be developed from observation? Yeah, um, I think really developing a completely accurate model would be an interesting research project, but we can probably do better than we are doing at the moment. As I said, there is code in Command Power Manager to do that. I believe the author has been looking for people to help work on making that more accurate. Ideally, we could possibly actually move that as Command Power Manager into something more generic and then have everything be able to make use of that. Right, so you would allow the uh, operating system to learn the behavior of the battery and then give you more accurate information. Right, obviously the behavior of the battery depends on certain things. Like if you get to a sufficiently low level, then suddenly asking for increased current draw might result in the voltage sagging and the system cutting off, whereas you could get another 20 minutes out as long as you don't go over this critical voltage. At that point, it's time to buy a new battery. <laughs> Right, so the question was about the 3G uh, radio devices and power management of those. For ones that are plugged into the side of your computer, the straightforward and easy thing to do at the moment is to unplug them when you don't want them to consume power, because it's USB also spent again. Uh, we probably can get that working fine, but unplug. there's actually a couple of patches to implement also suspend for the 3G drivers option in Sierra. But uh, last time I checked, they still hadn't got merged because nobody got around to testing them. Uh, you'll, I'll probably try to chase that up when I get home. For us, it's built in. Again, the all suspense stuff is helpful, but we're increasingly now getting support for drivers, uh, platform drivers that can provide an RF kill interface to allow you to enable and disable the 3G device. That will generally logically unplug them from the USB bus, and again, in that state, they'll consume basically no power. So. Um, yeah, there'll be an R your network manager or whatever will give you an option to turn this device off. It'll hit the RF kill, it'll vanish off the bus, and you'll be happy. Any idea if USB 3 has changed the semantics power management? I have no idea. Um, having recently had to spend even more time reading the 965 documentation and the ACPI spec again, the USB 3 spec is not one I've been particularly enthusiastic about looking at. So, uh, Mr. Woodhouse says, um, speaking on behalf of Intel, <laughs> that USB 3 will be better in this respect. <laughs> Jeff? So, the thing you said about line batteries, uh, is that connected to something that I've, I've observed, which I feel in this is a Matthew Garrett lecture, I have a rant about, which is the fact that your GNOME Power Manager battery applet bases its colour not on the amount of time you've got left in your battery, but on the percentage. So, my battery applet on my nice thing pad goes red at approximately the same amount of time left of battery as the guy next to me who has a big fat Dell has when his battery is full. All right, now that's uh, the issue there, of course, there is about the fact that, for instance, Command Power Manager draws things based on percentage rather than time. Uh, and to rant a bit more, I found a bug about this in the Ubuntu Bugzilla, right? And I got one of those automated messages saying, yes, is this bug still present? It's like, well, look at your battery applet, and you can see. Try talking to the database. That's what the bug is. That's how you properly... Uh, no, I think possibly one... Yeah. I'll admit that this is an easy mistake to make, but I think you're laboring under the misapprehension that Ubuntu has developers. <laughs> Uh, not necessarily a sensible design choice for the battery applets to uh, provide UA based on percentage when what users actually care about is time. Partly that's because we've been quite poor at S 
fascinating time in the past. But also, it's the problem that there's a it's like weird design decision that instead of there being a battery icon and then we draw some sort of percentage gradients along it, there are just four icons that are different colors. Yeah. Yeah, that should probably be fixed. That's been fixed? No, no, that should probably be fixed. Okay. Any more questions? question there is uh, about whether USB also spent would result in USB wireless mice uh, not freezing up after a period of inactivity. It could be, but I don't believe any reasonably current kernel or any reasonably current version of Linux enables also suspend, USB or suspend by default on input devices. So uh, one of the fun stories about USB or suspend and keyboards in this case so much misery. <laughs> a suspended USB device is only allowed to draw something like uh, 10 milliamps. Turns out this isn't enough current at 5 volts to be able to drive an LED. <laughs> so if you enable off suspend and if you have your mum lock key on, then it blinks in an irritating manner. So what we would basically have to do is disable USB or suspend if your non-lock LED is on. <laughs> or alternatively, we could change the kernel's default to not have the non-lock on. That would be awesome. Uh, but also, many keyboards lose the first few keystrokes when suspended because hardware vendors hate you. <laughs> Yeah, we could change it, but then you get the flickering LED effects as well. It's just, yeah. Anyway, one more question, I guess. Um, you talked about dropping the refresh rate on screens and making this search yeah. power. Could you possibly, when you've got some time where you're feeling in a good mood, add an option for us to users who have ice screen to um, just have a minimum threshold for that because that's low um, refresh rate. Okay, so the uh, suggestion there was that if we reduce the screen refresh rate, then uh, there could be increased flicker, and so users would want to be able to set the minimum frequency so that they don't get that flicker. That's true for CRTs, but we won't do this for CRTs. TFTs don't really care about the refresh rates as such. If you underdrive them too much, then you'll start getting flicker because the... <laughs> you'll start getting flicker because the crystals have begun to relax before you do the next frame. So, but that's something that is basically common across all TFTs. So there'll just be a sensible number that will prevent there being any perceptual flicker. Right. Um, get one more question, then that's it. Anyone? The question was, could we have a way of, say, at the package management level, indicating to users that particular pieces of software are crap? <laughs> uh, I think really the answer there is we shouldn't ship crap software. Or alternatively, we should file bugs against it, and then the package manager could tell you how many bugs there are open against a piece of software before you installed it. But really, yeah, we need to carry on finding these pieces of software. Okay, sometimes software is in the unfortunate situation where it has to wake up very often to see what it's trying to do because there's no best way of doing it. Maybe Dutch software should come with warnings about the effects of lab on power management, but most of these pieces of software have been fixed. I think we'll carry on doing that. Eventually, there won't be any common piece of software anyone cares about that will actually have a negative impact on your system. Okay, I'm out of time, so thanks very much.